Hello, ladies and gentlemen around the world. The time has come to make nature visible a part of official statistics and the system of environmental economic accounting, ecosystem accounting provides the international agreed framework to do just that. My name is Stefan Schweinfest. I'm the director of the United Nations Statistics Division in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Building Back Better, Natural Capital Accounting for, green, for a Green Recovery. And we want to convince you that the sentence I started this event with is true. This event is hosted by the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge and the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. We have had a lot of conversations of how we can build better and greener and what are the information systems and data that we need, the framework to do that. And we all agree that rigorous and high quality data and statistics are absolutely necessary to make responsible, sustainable uh, decisions uh, in the long run. So. That's why we're here to present to you the system of economic and environmental accounting, ecosystem accounting, a framework that will be brought in March 2021 to the United Nations Statistical Commission to be adopted as an international standard for natural capital accounting. And in order to lead us to the discussion with a very high level panel, we have a phenomenal uh, colleague Dr. Monica Contestabile, it's my pleasure to introduce her. She has an impressive academic and professional background, which you can find on the event website. And in order to have as much time as possible to discuss the substance without further ado, after welcoming all of you, I turn the floor over to her. Dr. Contestabile, Monica, the floor is yours. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, we have a very packed schedule today, so I'm going quickly through some housekeeping and then we'll move to introduce the panelists. So I just want to remind our audience that the event is being recorded and it will be available on the Bennett Institute website and the YouTube channel over the next few days. Uh, the event is organized in two parts. The first part is when I will prompt the panelists with a few questions um, to hear their remarks. And in the second part, um, uh, we will open the floor to a Q&A. So all of the attendees are very welcome to submit questions, which I will then pass to the panelists. And on the Zoom platform, you will see the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. So you just click on it and then uh, please type in your name, your affiliation and uh, the question and specify if you're addressing uh, one, uh, one guest speaker in particular. Uh, we would appreciate if you could stick to one question each uh, so that we give to as many as possible the option to interact with the panelists. And um, one final reminder, uh, we will be uh, tweeting throughout the webinar and we encourage all of the attendees to do so by using, using the hashtag uh, make nature count. Um, and now let's um, move on to introduce our esteemed panelists for the first part of this session. Uh, we have with us uh, Diane Coyle, who is the inaugural Bennett professor and co-director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. Welcome, Diane. And um, we have Serpata Dasgupta, who is Frank, Frank Ramsey, Professor Emeritus of Economics in the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Parta. And we have with us Elliot Harris, Chief Economist and Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, welcome, Elliot. And then we have with us also Beth Crosser, Deputy Director General of Statistics Netherlands, and also the Chair of the United Nations Committee of Experts on Environmental Economic Accounting. Welcome, Beth. So before we move to the questions, just a, a kind reminder to keep your answers short and concise. 
And if you want to comment on your colleague, on any of your colleagues' remarks, just raise your hand and, and I will give you the floor. Um, so my first question to you is, why do we need natural capital accounts? How can they trigger a transformation in economic thinking and also support the policies for the green recovery and beyond um, the green, the current situation and, and the need for a green recovery? Diane, do you want to have a go? Let me start um, and then others will want to come in as well. So first of all, the Bennett Institute is delighted to be co-hosting this very important event. Um, thinking about natural capital is part of our wealth economy program, which is one of our first and one of our flagship programs since we launched um, nearly three years ago. There are many intrinsic reasons for needing to uh, value natural capital better, and actually in every sense of the word value. But in particular in economics and in economic statistics, because it has been based on the assumption that um, the economy and nature are separate spheres. And we need to put nature inside the boundary of what we think of as the economy, because without it, there wouldn't be any economy. We're completely reliant on, on what economists call in our wonderful jargon, natural capital services. And um, the importance of taking a, a wealth-based approach is that you um, have an imperative for sustainability if you're monitoring those in the statistics, because to value assets of any kind, including natural capital, you've got to think about the future because their value today is going to depend on their, um, their state, their condition and their ability to provide services in the future. So um, it absolutely embeds sustainability in decision-making if you have policymakers looking at natural capital in this way. So I'll pause there and let others pick up and answer the question. Parta, you wanna have a go? I think you muted. There's very little to add, but the because Dan has got it exactly right. Um, you could pr provide data on the state of natural capital, it would be a first run, so physical uh, quality um, information, state of a forest, wetland, and so forth. Uh, but then you need to need to obviously to for aggregation purposes, you need to value them. And um, in principle, a great many of these items can be valued, uh, but even in principle, there'll be some which are not valuable in the sense of not being able to value, not that they're not valuable. Uh, take, for example, patches of forest which are taken to be sacred by a community. They would not wish to put a dollar value to it. By sacredness, effectively, they'll be saying that there are boundaries around it that should not be touched. So it's almost like saying it's got an infinite value, complete protection. But it is absolutely essential to have um, uh, accounts for your capital assets um, because it's very much like the balance sheets of firms. Uh, the entire future is reflected in the assets you've got. And the valuation of the assets depends on what you intend to do with them quite apart from the state. And one final remark, you need natural capital valuation is part of a jigsaw puzzle. The others are produced capital and human capital. So you want wealth accounts, which is what Diana began by addressing. And you need it for two reasons. One is that you might want to ask whether we are better off today or we and our future people, generations are better off in a better place today than we were last year or the year before a decade ago. And that's sort of the basis of sustainability analysis. And the question arises to how you want to measure that. And wealth accounts allow you that framework because it's telling you whether the wealth has gone going up or down as the years go by. And there's a theorem which says that that's linked to welfare, by the way. And the other reason, and I'll stop there, is the familiar one, which is not very familiar to people, which is when you choose projects or when a government makes policy decisions or chooses, makes decisions over project, investment projects, 
they, they, have a, they have to have a criterion for choosing or between alternatives. And this standard criterion, the one which has been in existence for a long time, has understood very well, is net present value of the benefits, the flow of benefits of projects. And that's a correct way of doing things. But if you ask yourself what net present value actually amounts to, it is a measure of the stock of assets, of the, the, the wealth that is changed by introducing the project. So it's a alteration in your wealth. And of course, that's a very nice result to have because you're saying that what the UN is involved, engaged in now is something which we have been doing for a long time anyway, but through the back door without our noticing it. Thank you. Uh, Elliot. Thank you very much, Monica. I think uh, for me, the reason to look at this is because it allows us to start making policies in a way that is consistent with what we actually want policy to deliver. After the Second World War, we, we came up with an idea that we had to recover our economies. Everything was lying in ruins after the, the, the destruction of the war. Over time, we've concentrated on the economics, but we've sort of treated the economics as supreme. It was the most important objective. And we assumed essentially if we got the economics right, everything else would fall into place. We've seen over the last decades that that is simply not true. But the measure of economic prosperity that we've been using simply doesn't allow us to understand how we are doing on the other two dimensions. And the new, um, well, reasonably new uh, paradigm of sustainable development with its three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental, forces us to start thinking about how well we're doing in all three dimensions at the same time. This means we need to think about policy in an integrated way. And what has always bothered me as an economist working in that field is that we know that there are spillover effects of any policy decision that's taken in the economic sphere. Spillover effects that go out into the other two dimensions. And we know that the way in which our economics proceed depends as well on what is happening in the other two dimensions, and yet we don't try to track those channels. This approach of natural capital, as the father just explained, allows us to understand what is happening on the natural assets front, how those are changing, and that allows us also to see, well, what is the real impact of our economic policies? Now, once we have that in place, once we can value it, it's not going to be a perfect measure, but it does give us a sense of where, in what direction our policies are driving us, and it gives us a sense of what policies we should stop doing or change so that we don't render damage that we can't recover from later on. Of course, we still have to do the same on the social side. We have to integrate our social accounts, if you will, into our overall measure of progress. But I think the key point here is that perfidious thing, externalities, that all of us learn about in the first year of economic studies, it, it is perfidious because it's hidden and we don't have to focus on it. This exposes it to, to clear scrutiny. And it means that our policies have to take into account the indirect spillover effects that we may have and if we don't take those into account, we end up with the type of situation we're trying to rectify today. This is a major step in that direction. Thank you. Bert. Yes, thank you. Well, I guess um, it has been said by the other panelists, uh, we need integrated decision making um, on the economy, on the environment, but I think also on health and social well-being. If you see at the corona crisis that we're all present in, uh, if you take a policy measure, it affects all four of them. You cannot see them as separate. You have to make integrated decisions. And to make integrated decisions, um, we need integrated statistical data, uh, because that's another lesson from the corona crisis. We need good statistics, good data to base our analysis and base our policies on. So um, national capital accounting is part of the answer. It describes the environment nature in such a way that integrated decision-making with the economy is possible. As Elliot said, nature is not just an externality. It's the essence that drives the economy, that drives uh, our, our, our being, the reason that we can live. So the statistical worlds have um, long been working on a sound and well-defined system to uh, make this national capital accounting possible, this CA, as uh, Stefan Swinefest introduced, System of Environmental Economic Accounting. And basically, um, it's a way to describe the environment in such a way that it can be rely, um, related to the way we usually describe our economy. Uh, our economy is described in uh, economic growth, in 
gross domestic product and using the same classifications, concepts, definitions, if you describe the environment, there's a way to do, uh, to really possibly relate the macroeconomic statistics to environment. So to change natural stocks, conditions of ecosystems, to study the dependencies of nature and to study trade-offs. You can also follow it in time to see whether the contributions that nature gives to our economy are not too much if we're not overstretching and we're still giving capital to future generations. Well, almost 100 countries produced CA accounts uh, already, uh, parts of CA accounts, describing use of input from nature, uh, water, timber, fish, uh, but also the waste back going into um, nature, environmental expenditures and taxes. A relatively new addition is what Stefan already mentioned, the ecosystem accounts. There we do not look in individual resources, but ecosystems as a whole, the combination of um, uh, living creatures uh, and the whole of the ecosystem. We describe the extent, uh, the condition, but also the services. And by describing the services, we can make visible what they uh, leave and, and what they uh, contribute to our economy. Um, we hope that the largest part will be uh, accepted as a statistical standard and marched, as Stefan said. Thank you. Uh, I think we've covered already, already a lot of ground, including one of the questions, the other questions I had for the panelists. I'd like to move to ask you now a more practical question, which is what are the impediments uh, to the implementation of natural capital accounts? And, and how can these impediments can be overcome? How do we move into the practice of it? Um, Pata, do you want to start? Very briefly, I wouldn't be the ideal expert here to answer that question, but I can talk about some of the theoretical problems that arise. First of all, it's, it's the case that the unusualness of it is what would be the first obstacle. About seven years ago, I, in fact, exactly seven years ago, I submitted a report to the, the then Prime Minister of India, uh, Manmohan Singh, uh, at the request of the government to prepare a, produce a report on uh, wealth accounting for India. And uh, the, there was no problem accepting it because one of my, uh, the secretary to the, to the committee, commission was the chief statistician of India. So, he was sitting right there on the office, which is going to deliver. But I think initially there was problems of communication with uh, decision makers in government because they're used to flow accounts, accounts of uh, economic flows, GDP. And we were looking for stocks. This is asset accounting. And as asset accounting, uh, and I have to explain to them that we hand over assets to our children. We don't hand over services to our children. So all the trade exchanges across time and across people is over, over assets, in other words, durable goods. And it's the durableness of it, which is conveying everything about the future uh, that you, uh, depending on how you intend to use it. So it's, that's the first resistance. The second is of course, operational and Bert will have, uh, and, and Elliot and Dan have better sense of the difficulties. I myself have done quite a bit of applied work with uh, Kenneth Arrow and others uh, and published the, some of the first cross-country uh, estimates, and then time series for a limited number of countries, which we could get it. And I can tell you, it's very hard work. No question about it, Try, particularly human capital. Health is extremely difficult. Uh, and then of course, you've got ecosystem services, and that's really hard. You start with some approximate market prices, but then there'll be some which don't have market prices at all. So the idea is to keep on trying to correct uh, as far as you can. Um, so I think the big stumbling block is lack of experience. That's the main thing because we are not used to, in GDP calculations, we are not used to estimating externalities, the point that Elliot made, mentioned and Bert mentioned previously. And of course, that's at the, heart, the root of the problem because most natural capital don't have markets or many natural capital assets don't have markets. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. I think um, one of the biggest uh, difficulties is that it's going to require a change in mindset of those who would use that information. Hmm? Policymakers in the economic sphere have been habituated, as Sipatha just said, to looking at GDP. It's a flow um, concept. And 
we were brought up that way. So we, we know what we wanted to, to do and we know how it's done. And the measurement question was resolved at the very outset. So everybody measures GDP and, the, and those flows in exactly the same way. It's comparable across and that comparability is really important for the policymaker. Now we're asking for the policymaker, let's say in the economic sphere, to start thinking about the value of a forest. And as Apatha said, there's no market for that. So the mindset of how we think about the value, it, it doesn't apply. It simply doesn't apply here. And this is really difficult for building up the understanding, the awareness of how different a concept this actually is. And yet, in basic principle, it should be much easier for people to absorb. Because in essence, what we're talking about here is what is the basis of future prosperity? And we want to define prosperity in a broader sense, that it's not just about how much produced capital we have, which is what GDP gives us, but it's a question about um, how much natural capital do we have and how is that evolving over time? It's how strong is our human capital base and how can we improve it? And those are the elements I think that are going to be the most difficult to overcome. But once we do overcome them, they will lead to a quantum improvement in the quality of policy because then we will be able to take into account not just what we're doing today and how it affects the flows today, but how those flows contribute to either building up or depreciating the stock that we will need to give us a, a good foundation for future prosperity, future sustainable prosperity, I might add. I'll stop there, thanks. Yes, um, combining what, what Elliot and Parta said, um, well, obviously um, we need to, to have experiences and expertise. And that's why we statisticians cannot and, and do not want to do it alone. Um, it's very important to work together with academics and make use of the large knowledge there is about modeling, especially about the services that ecosystems give. Um, and it's also important to work together with the policymakers to explain them what it is. It's not some intrinsic value of nature we're making. We're just telling what, what the contributions are to the economy and using that to put value on it, but there's something else than, than something, how much would you pay for it? There's no consumer surplus or whatever. So um, it's important to explain and working together for this community on this uh, with academics and policymakers is, is quite essential. In Netherlands, we have a very successful example. In Netherlands, 8% of Netherlands is peatlands. And if you drain that, it's excellent agricultural lands, especially for dairy farming. So our good cheese comes from there. But if you drain peatlands, there's a lot of organic material coming to the surplus and there's a lot of carbon dioxide emissions. <clears throat> so what we did together with the University of Wageningen is try to model using the same concepts of national accounts. So how much money is earned by the farmers doing the draining? On the other hand, what are the costs of the uh, greenhouse gases if you do the draining? And it turned out that the costs were much higher than the gains of the farmers by farming. And actually we talked a lot to our policymakers and it's led to a law and a lot of money uh, being made available to farmers being subsidized to stop farming. So, and the only reason that we had this success was by making use of this university knowledge of modeling, trying to really use that knowledge, how to do it and work together with the policymakers, not one conversation, but many conversations to explain them, to ask them what their issues are, to try to understand each other uh, in very close interaction. So I think close interaction with policymakers and with uh, academics is essential for us. Diane. I would um, underline this point about communication that Partha and Elliot have made because <laughs> it isn't just that policymakers and others need to understand the difference in this approach, it's that they all need to buy into it at, in a coordinated way. It's like changing technical standards from a two pin plug to a three pin plug because these are international standards and that's why the role of the United Nations and other international fora is so important in driving this. But I do think it's the right time um, Elliot started by mentioning the um, economy, GDP being the right tool for the times in the post-war years. I think where we are now, the, this approach, this wealth accounting approach, natural capital approach is, is where we are and need to be. So it will need um, the coordination, but also actually the effort and resource put into it. Uh, Bert didn't mention it, but I would say statistical agencies need a lot more resources to do the work because it is painstaking and, and time consuming and it will, it will take some time. Um, luckily, technology is making it easier. Things like um, you know, satellite imaging, um, the ability to use new techniques and uh, big data to get a handle on some of these will help make it easier over time. 
but we've got to do the work. We've got to decide it's important. We've all got to agree and we've got to do the work. Thank you. Yes, Parta. You muted. Apologies. Yeah, I think I'm back on. Uh, the, the, these are exceptionally important points that have just been made by my colleagues. So I wanted to add one thing, which is um, it is possible to convey the stock figures, say satellite imaging, you get a sense, sense of the extent of a forest. You can even peer down to es estimate the biomass in it and so forth. That's for sure. But natural ca capital ca counting also requires, and therefore the rest of the counting system also requires prices to be able to aggregate across. Now there, I would put one piece of caution on, in our mind. When we compare nations in terms of their income, this country is richer than that country and so forth. We're using market prices and it's a perfectly meaningful notion. And um, of course you can correct for, um, uh, you know, PPP, that sort of correction. That's, that's not what I have in mind. You can, you can do cross country comparisons. Shadow prices or accounting prices, which is what we are really involved with here, are softer objects than market prices. You don't look up, uh, you don't call the, uh, the uh, border security people to say what the FOB or CB, CFI price are for, for, for natural capital. Much of it is really accounting prices. And there, people may have different cultures will attribute different values to it. So I would be much more wary of cross national comparisons of wealth. On the whole, it should be limited in my judgment, it's safest to stick to time series of, of a particular economy across time. Is it now richer or wealthier now than it was last year or the year before? Uh, so you can do sustainability analysis very well. And of course you can do policy analysis very well too, because as I suggested right in my, the beginning, uh, present discount value of net benefits is a perturbation to your wealth. So you can do that. What I would be worried about is if we start saying, well, this country is, has great, is per capita wealth is greater than the other because uh, these are accounting prices. They are much more softer animals. And one country could say, yes, that's right. But you may say that, but we value this much more here than that country does. And so uh, the comparison is illegitimate. Thank you. Right. I think we are now moving to the questions from the floor, which are increasing in number. Um, so I've got one question uh, for uh, Parta. Doesn't allowing one group to claim a forest is sacred make that group a dictator? And this is from Elephanical Yale University. How do we adjudicate that set of rights? Who and when a group gets to be a dictator? Oh, golly. Uh, <laughs> that's an impossible <laughs> question to ask. I, I couldn't say who has the right. That's uh, typically, of course, you might, the first point of contact would be historical rights. That's mm. how we, very often uh, the political dialogues takes place. We. We're actually, just even as we speak, we are discussing it in the Brexit negotiations over rights to fisheries in uh, waters and the, and the UK, you know, English water, but UK's waters. Um, and the stamp and good argument is that they've been shared for many, many years. Uh, so this, I think the historical thing is, it has a good precedence. It's a tangible thing, it's recordable uh, and people like, and people feel affronted for being thrown out. So when dams are built, high dams are built and communities are moved, uh, sometimes without any compensation, uh, they, that's, a, that's a rather clearer set of rights being violated. And they could need, need not say it's because of sacredness, it's simply say we have always lived here and we don't want to go, we, want, we don't want to move, or, or certainly not at the compensation that being presented. So I think it, it, the question is extremely important because property rights have not been designed for so many of these co commodities. They're not established in so many communities. Uh, but I, I, I guess his, the historical rights will be the, will play a president, will have a precedence on this. That's my guess. Thank you. We have a question from Bill Clark, Harvard University. So he's asking, 
imagine that I want to measure the sustainability of London's development trajectory. What are the practical challenges of correctly accounting for London's import of natural resources from around the world to support the well-being of its residents? I guess this is for any of the panelists who want to have a go. Well, nobody's leaping in, um, so I'll start and hopefully others will, will pick up um, behind me. So I, th I think the key for me is to think about this in um, a very rounded way, to think about the whole uh, portfolio of assets of the location that you're thinking about, be it a country or, or a city. And um, to get a better sense of um, welfare broadly understood and how that links into SDGs um, and, and that suite of, um, of measures. And there are, complement, there are complementarities between these. So you wouldn't pick on only natural capital. As others have already said, you also need to think about the human capital, the social and institutional framework, because they interact with each other. Um, you know, hu humans' mental well-being depends on access to nature. We've seen recently that um, interaction with nature has uh, some profound health impacts. Um, but equally, the environment, you know, the environment community lives in um, will affect their ability to steward nature rather than exploit it unsustainably. So this is why we take this broad wealth economy framework that we're trying to think about these things in, in the ground, focusing on all of society's assets. And without these accounts, we just can't determine whether or not we're making any, any progress towards them. So thinking about all of them and also thinking about the interactions between them is very important. As for practical steps, then you just have to start by trying to do the measurements, which is what so many of us spend a lot of time trying to do. I can, um, Monica, I have a supplementary set of remarks to Diane. Diane was exactly right, of course. Um, this question is from somebody in Harvard, so presumably there's some economics background, probably. Uh, we were talking about accounting prices or shadow prices. Some people call it social values the prices, the weights to be attached to the various types of capital assets. Uh, natural capital is one, uh, or bits of natural capital, and so forth. Now, these accounting prices, these shadow prices themselves are picking up the complementarities that Diane was mentioning. Uh, because the definition of an accounting price is the additional, the, 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 the contribution an additional unit of an asset would make to human well-being uh, over time, today, tomorrow, day after, and so forth, because it's a durable good, remember. So if you ask yourself, if we had one more unit uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a wetland, a similar wetland, another similar wetland, uh, other things equal, what would, what would be uh, the increase in wealth, uh, in, increasing social well-being? That's the definition of an accounting price. Now, to answer that question, of course, you will be saying, well, what will happen is a it's counterfactual. You've got to have an economic model at the back of your mind and you're or actually on your computer. Uh, and you're asking yourself, if we had that, what would be the change in the tra future trajectory of our economy? That's what we're trying to measure. The change in wealth being arising out of the fact that the trajectory that the economy would be, would be falling would be slightly different from what it would be without this additional wetland. That's what we mean by accounting price. And for that, Diane is exactly right, because you need to know the interaction between the human, the people working away, the factories and so forth and so on. So these accounting prices have an enormous amount of information coded in it, implicit in it. Um, and there are plenty of models without natural capital where these uh, complementarities have been estimated or have been taken into account when estimating shadow prices. The prin in principle, there is no difference by when you add natural capital to the thing. Of course, practical applications becomes that much harder because you don't even have a first approximation in market prices. So the whole thing has to be, is very model-based. Yeah. Elliot, you wanted to add something. Thank you. Um, I sort of fixated on uh, three words which I thought I heard in the way you read out the question, um, use of resources from around the world. And I yes. thought, and that sparked me to think that part of the question that was actually being asked is, um, could it be that the city of London is advancing its own well-being on the back at the cost at the expense 
of those who provide the resources. And I think that's indeed a, a very important factor to take into consideration because it does speak to an issue that many countries confront, countries that are exporters of natural resources, primary commodities. Can they translate that use of their natural capital into an increased base for future prosperity. And in many respects, countries have failed to do so in large part because they haven't been taking into account what the intrinsic value of those natural assets actually is. And we see in situations where many countries have exported a lot of their natural resources, even more um, compellingly when it's exhaustible natural resources without taking that into account and failing to translate the revenues gained from the sale of those natural assets into investments in the other two types of capital which would raise the overall level of prosperity or the basis for future prosperity going forward. In many cases, that has been a part, at least this is my view, of the explanation of that infamous middle income trap, why countries have managed to increase their welfare up to a point and then seem to stagnate there. Now, one would hope that as we introduce this taking account of natural assets, that countries would realize that the use of these natural exhaustible resources needs to be very carefully monitored. And there will come a point where the, the cost to the country, to the host, to the origin country, becomes prohibitive, prohibitively high. And that should then at some point reflect itself in a market price. So that if the city of London, I'm sorry, we shouldn't really victimize London this way, but if the city of London is drawing up more resources from around the world uh, in order to raise its uh, prosperity, that th that would have an, in an increasing cost that would reflect the, uh, the, the depletion of those natural assets elsewhere. Thank you. Parker, yes. This is a very, very important point that's just been raised and I've written it a lot. Oh. The counter argument to what Elliot has said by a free trader would be, well, it doesn't matter if City of London pays for it, full social cost of the stuff that it's importing and raising its wealth, what's the harm? To which Elliot and I would counter by saying, that, well, actually they're not paying. That's the whole point. And basically what's happening, because it's an extremely important point regarding the desirability of free trade. We throw this mantra around about the benefits of free trade, but it is only beneficial if there is a complete set of markets. That is to say, the commodities are being, the, the payment made for commodities that are imported are, 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 is the social cost from the importing country's point of view. And typically what's happening is that the prices that are being charged by the exporting country for raw materials typically will not have taken into account these externalities that Elliot was mentioning. And so it will be underpriced, which in the language that we're using here today means what? That there actually there is a wealth transmission transfer from the poorer countries to the richer countries. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is something which is, I've been writing for years on it, but nobody seems to have noticed that one of the real theorems here is, is the fact that free trade in the sense as is practiced today uh, is, is very much in line with a, a position many radical economists took in the past that wealth is being transferred from the poorer nations to the richer nations. And this, this is not a conspiracy theory, by the way. It doesn't have to be conspiracy. It's pure and simple lack of pricing the externalities. Thank you. More questions from the audience. Um, we have quite a few. I'm trying to pick one that is there is one on implementation issues. So Ken Bagstad from the US Geological Survey is asking, how can we best build demand for natural capital accounts information from decision makers so that accounts are regularly produced and used? Where is demand for natural capital accounts information being best cultivated? Yes, Bennett. Well, I, um, I think it's by, uh, by doing a lot of uh, showing of examples and making experience and show how it can work. 
Um, so uh, the fact that in March we will have this uh, ecosystem accounting as uh, a standard proposed will help and we need to have a lot of examples. So at the moment there are almost 25 countries, also large nature rich countries like uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa, India, China, making these ecosystem accounts and, and showing how important they are and how they can really show the value of ecosystems and contribution to nature um, really helps. So I think a lot of good examples helps and it's both to the national governments and also to the international organizations, the post 2020 biodiversity agenda, the SDGs, the climate change agenda. I think one of the good things of um, the CIA is that uh, I agree with Parta that it's difficult to compare things over countries uh, because countries are different. The PPP is not enough. Uh, but at least um, we try to do that with SNA and compare economic growth of countries. And we try to do the same with CIA by looking at value of services. So I think uh, one of the main answers is to, to make a lot of good examples uh, and show them both to national governments and to show how important it is to have an underlying statistical framework for these large international initiatives like uh, biodiversity, uh, SDGs and climate change. Yes, Diane. Yeah, I very much agree with Bert that um, examples and case studies will, will really help. And that's also a practical way to start to do the work that's needed in, in this. Um, but the other thing that's happening at the moment is that the process of revising the system of national accounts is underway, the definition of GDP and so on. So I think in that there's really an opportunity to make sure that um, ecosystem accounting and also household accounting really articulate with the measures that policymakers are already very used to. And this is an opportunity to have that conversation and get people familiar um, and then the third thing that's happening at the moment is because of the pandemic and the economic crisis, a, a very strong focus on green recovery. And how are we going to know it's a green recovery? Well, this is how we've got to do it. Thank you. I think we have just time for one more and one brief answer. Um, here I have one on, doesn't natural capital, uh, provide an easy occasion to strengthen the neoliberal policy agenda rather than weaken it? This is from Victor Canilla. Uh, I'm happy to start off and I, I presume that's a comment about whether it's ever right to put a price on nature as people might phrase it and it's something that um, often comes up in conversation. Nobody in the economics or statistics community is saying that nature uh, is just a commodity and that it doesn't have any intrinsic values. But I think as economists and statisticians, we have a responsibility to um, make sure that those links between economic decisions and the environment are understood and, and it's reflected in decisions that people are taking that affect the environment. Because if we don't do that, we're saying in, the, in these domains of decision-making, we're putting a value of zero on it and that must be wrong. We must start taking it into account. Thank you. I think we are, I now have to bring this to a close. There are many more questions um, on the list. Unfortunately, we have got time only for a few. Um, I'd like to ask each one of you uh, to just do one final remark, like, you know, about the, the future and the future of uh, this new system of accounting. Uh, uh, statistics, um, you know, it's going to look like and, and how you see the future if, if you're optimistic and and hopeful that things will will change. What, what is your your final thought here? Diane, you want to start? Um, so we've we've uh, we've just published a report about called Building Forward. And this phrase about building back better has um, become quite prevalent, but the point about focusing on the assets is that it, it makes you think about the future. And we need a vote of confidence in what the future is going to hold for us. Thinking about all of society's assets, you know, as Partha said right at the start, this is like thinking about a balance sheet and no company, no household would ever think that it was adequate only to think about their, their flow of income, they'd think about their assets too. And so, the importance of this for me is really all about driving sustainability 
and driving confidence in the future and making sure that we don't continue to give future generations the bad deal that we have given them in the past half century. Thank you. Beth? Yes, I'm quite optimistic that this will grow bigger. Um, I mean, um, in Europe, there's the Green Deal. Uh, everywhere around, you see uh, more focus on the environment. And you can only study the environment if you take the economy into account and the other way around. We need these integrated descriptions. Uh, we cannot see nature as an externality. We need this integrated way to look at it. We want to give natural capital to our uh, future generations in order for them also to um, have the flow of services. So I think uh, there's a lot of interest. Uh, and, and of course, I uh, think are needed uh, as Diane said money is needed expertise but there's also some interesting global developments uh, using remote sensing trying to to map these ecosystems all over the world um, by using analysis techniques big data so I think there are a lot of exciting possibilities uh, but uh, yeah, we have to contact the policy makers show the usefulness by examples and then I'm quite optimistic this will take on and it's not really necessary thank you Parta. Yeah, I'd like like fellow panelists. I'm very optimistic that this is going to this is going to uh, take precedence in accounting terms. Um, if you think of the states of GDP estimates back in 1950, probably uh, if you read published papers there, they were extremely crude. They were very tentative, and uh, the cross-country comparisons were very tenuous and so forth. So there's some long ways to go, but. Do bear in mind that we've had now a sequence of three uh, studies starting in 2012 and 2014, um, inclusive wealth uh, studies uh, that UNEP um, uh, sponsored. The first two were 2012, 2014, and then the last one was 2018, and a reach of about 140 countries and looking at it a uh, period uh, of time. 10 to 12 years, I think, I can't often tell you, remember, uh, and trying to estimate the, uh, the directions in which the various forms of capital, produced capital, human capital, and uh, natural capital had been moving. So these were time series uh, estimates of about 140 countries. And what was being compared was relative performances across countries, not whether one country was richer than another. So it's consistent with the warning I was suggesting that perhaps we shouldn't go for saying that one country is wealthier than another, although we may have views on that, but it's the growth rates or lack of growth rate or negative or positive, which really matters. So we've had now quite a bit of experience and I suspect UNEP is going to continue to sponsor these studies and they'll become richer as the time goes. Thank you, Elliot. I'm not a historian, but I, I do tend to see sort of historical cycles. Uh, I, I, sometimes an idea needs to wait until its time has come. We've known about sustainable development since at least the, the Brundtland report in 87, but we only get a sustainable development agenda in 2015. Uh, we had the financial crisis in 2008, the green recovery comes out, the green economy concept flourishes. And I think now we have another huge opportunity because COVID has highlighted all of the fault lines, all of the weaknesses of our various societies shown that you know, we may all be affected by it, but it's not affecting us all equally. It's the quality of our processes that really makes a difference. We may have economic growth, but if that's generating a degradation of, of the environment of our nature, then the quality of that growth is not acceptable, it's not sustainable. And I think that is one of the huge advantages that I promised myself, and I think that all of us are, are looking forward to from this innovation, is that we are able now to take into account other bits of information that give us a sense of where we actually are heading in terms of our well-being, our prosperity, our future on this planet. Now. This is not the end of the journey. I think we have a similar job to do on the social side. But I think the social side we will manage because we will have the advantage of the environmental side, the ecosystems accounts, which are, I think um, difficult as well to, to get a grip on. And we're at that, we're at the brink of it now. We, we're at the point where we can envisage overcoming the curse of externalities, at least on the environmental side. And once we do that, we start doing policy with a clear sense of the quality of that policy and how that policy will contribute to our sustainability, to our well-being, to our prosperity over time. And I think that is a, a huge innovation 
whose time now has come. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for all for sharing your insights with uh, our participants, and thank you for all the attendees. We now have just a bit of time to share a recorded message um, from uh, Norbert Bartel, the Parliamentary State Secretary to the Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development in Germany. And then I'll hand over to Stefan for the concluding remarks. Thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic shows how dependent our societies and economies are on the very foundation of our world, our natural capital. The spread of zoonotic diseases is directly linked to the destruction of biodiversity and natural habitats. So we must not return to business as usual after COVID-19. We cannot effort a global economy that builds prosperity at the expense of the environment, the global climate and the well-being of millions of people and generations to come. We urgently need to build back better by using recovery programs to invest in a green recovery that promotes sustainable development. The European Green Deal provides a good basis for these efforts. The German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development supports a green recovery. We are therefore providing 20 million euros to the World Bank's Green Recovery Initiative. And through our emergency COVID-19 support program, with over 4 billion euros in funding, we help our partner countries to lay the foundations for sustainable development. In order to promote a green recovery, we need to improve the ways in which we define and measure development. The protection of natural capital needs to be integrated in our assessments. Otherwise, we will miss an important piece of the picture, such as the many benefits of forests. They not only store carbon, they also provide clean air and water and reduce the risk of future pandemics, to name just a few. A recent study estimated that biodiversity provides more than 170 trillion US dollars in ecosystem services each year. That is more than twice annual global GDP. Policymakers around the world need to be aware that natural capital accounting is critical because it helps us to take better informed decisions. Our ministry has therefore been working closely with the World Bank and other partners to help 26 countries to better understand and manage their natural capital. Moreover, we have started a green value initiative to highlight the ecosystem services provided by conservation areas and thus their socio-economic importance. Last but not least, we work with UNSD to help standardize and roll out natural capital accounting worldwide. I call on all of you to join the effort for a green recovery. The more determined we act now, the faster we will reap the benefits. A healthy environment, more resilient and sustainable economies, and healthier, more prosperous people. Thank you. Well, now uh, we're bringing this to a close and I hand over the floor to Stefan for the concluding remarks. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. Wow, wow, wow. This was quite an event. Uh, I think uh, from my perspective, I can say it was not only very, very interesting, it was also really, really fun uh, to listen. Uh, as a director of the UN Statistics Division, I'm always wondering uh, what should we measure? How should we measure it? and when should we measure it and there was such a rich discussion addressing all of this uh, these questions and there were users producers in the room and the academic support of giving us the scientific background so this was really a very very rich panel so i would really like to thank everybody who was involved i mean our partners uh, in the bennett institute of cambridge university to organize this event uh, a big thank you to Monica, uh, who managed us very, very well. Time is perfect, and you made it all interactive. Everybody participated, and it was really a lively debate through, I don't even know how many time zones here. I really uh, appreciate all the contribution, the valuable contributions of the panelists, uh, Professor Diane, uh, Professor Barta, Beat, Elliot, this was really very special and I should not definitely also forget my own team that put this uh, together and helped to, to work on this under the leadership of Alessandra Alfieri. So um, I hope we whet your appetite and if you want to know more and uh, there are of course our websites, our respective websites of the Institute and our uh, UN Statistics Division and you will find a lot more information and reports and plans for the future. So please go there. Uh, let me also thank all of you around the world who have connected to this event and have shown us uh, your interest. Uh, I was particularly pleased, I'm a little national accountant, I should confess by background, uh, that there was such a long historical line drawn from the beginnings of national accounting uh, to where we are right now. And we all know that the system of national accounts and the GDP rose from the ashes of World War II, when it was critically important for policy and decision makers to manage the economy and have appropriate information systems. But today's policy and decision makers need much more complex and in particular integrated information systems that help us to manage the short, medium and long-term consequences of COVID, for instance, the current crisis and our sustainable development goals. We are deeply convinced at the UN that the system of environment and economic accounting, the C as we affectionately refer to it, provides that much needed uh, framework for the development integrating integrated information systems and bringing out that economic and environmental nexus as many of you have it so well described today. So we are really looking forward to working with all of you on the CIA on uh, its implementation around the world and on making it uh, a basis for uh, decision making for the future and building back better and greener. So thank you to everybody who participated today. Have a good day wherever you are and in particular take good care of yourself. Thank you.